Weeks ago, Bulovo released a new dive watch within their heritage collection based on an obscure prototype produced in collaboration with the US Navy in the late 1950s, the Bulova Millships. These watches offer a strikingly close execution to the original design and prototype in which they're based and are available as either a limited edition with a Salita caliber or a regular production model with a Miyota movement. So are these watches new vintage inspired divers that are going to be mainstays in the category? Are they forced creations or something in between? We'll discuss that and a lot more in this video. Let's jump into it. So to understand these watches, one needs to first understand the period and prototype that has led to these to be created. To begin our story here, we have to go back to 1955 when the US Bureau of Ships outlined a military contract for a submersible wristwatch intended for use by specialized diving units of the US Navy, including explosive ordnance disposal and underwater demolition teams, a predecessor to the US Navy SEALs. After a lengthy development process, Bulova presented a purpose-built prototype that was, along with several commercially available dive watches, tested by the US Navy over the course of several years in the late 1950s. Despite not every detail of this period surfacing in the public domain, what is certain is that after several rounds of testing, Bulova elected not to pursue the design or develop further prototypes, with the contract eventually being awarded to the Torneck Rayville TR900, essentially a rebadge Blancpain 50 Fathoms intended to subvert the US made provisions called for by the Buy American Act. It's also possible that Bulova had other priorities or didn't consider this particular military contract to be worthwhile in terms of volume as Bulova was in that era a big time mass market brand. But despite the backstory of this prototype, it eluded the attention of the brand for decades, with the US Navy prototype from the 1950s existing only in legend until a certain vintage Bulova collector presented one of the original models to the brand a few years ago. And with the help of the same collector, Bulova elected to recreate the design package in a contemporary format. So before we jump into this video, we do have both the limited edition and the standard production models available on teddybaldasar.com. So if you're liking what you're seeing here today, definitely go check those out. But for the focus of this video here today, we're gonna to be putting the spotlight mostly on the limited edition version. We'll talk a little bit more about it. And then at the end, I'll just share some final thoughts on what this line kind of means for Bulova, my final points of consideration, and just my general thoughts on them in their entirety. Digging into the Swiss made limited edition mill ships, let's start with the dimensions as they are a bit unorthodox in certain areas. At 41 millimeters in diameter and around 50.7 millimeters lug to lug, the mill ship is supposedly a one-to-one -one recreation of the original watch in terms of sizing and proportions, meaning the original prototype would have been substantial by vintage standards. In terms of thickness, the limited edition mill ships comes in at 16 millimeters with a good portion, and I mean a good portion of that measurement coming from the highly dome profile of the crystal. In fact, without including that crystal, the thickness is just around 11 millimeters. So keep that in mind. You don't feel much of that thickness in its wear. So it's nowhere close to that 16 millimeters, but that crystal is without question one of the most exaggerated executions I can think of in a modern dive watch. But it looks spectacular, different viewing angles, and despite the height, the watch doesn't feel or act overly tall in practice. On wrist, the mill ships as a package where slightly smaller than the diameter might suggest, thanks to the prominent bezel as well as the smaller lugs, both in verticality and width, measuring just 16 millimeters between. Examining some of the early reactions, the narrow lugs have been a point of criticism for this model, though the measurement is a direct carryover from the original. But personally, I do get the contention, given that when you're talking about third-party options, these are gonna be in limited supply at 16 millimeters. This particular 16 millimeters 
millimeter black nylon pull through strap is based on what would have been used with the prototype. While it does recreate the look and feel, it does leave a bit to be desired for a watch just south of $2,000. Moving to the rest of the case design, we are keeping with the Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms of the 1950s era with simple 90 degree angles at the lugs, straight case sides, and some fastening as you approach the case back, which in this case is one of the more striking elements of this watch for a couple of reasons. For one, the case back's construction features a press fit center portion and a separate screw down ring utilized to push the center into a gasket, making the seal tighter as pressure rises. This is a carryover of the original design and is akin to the approach you'll see with the venerable Vostok Amphibia. What is modern here though is a fully engraved diver helmet relief that I think is a lot of fun, even if not necessarily in line with the original use case. In the three o'clock position, a six millimeter screw down sign crown aids the case back in achieving the watch's 200 meters of water resistance. Jumping back to the front of the watch, we have a somewhat unique bezel execution in line with the original, which you actually have to push the bezel down in order to rotate with 60 positions to choose from. In practice, the bezel takes some getting used to, but was chosen as a point of development back in the day in order to ensure the bezel would be locked into place to offer precise elapsed time. The bezel insert comes in anodized aluminum with loom markers to assist with nighttime legibility. And again, we will talk about the limited edition version versus the Miyota powered caliber version at the end of the video. Taking our eyes beyond the photogenic dome crystal, we are greeted with more attractive appeal with its dial that keeps with the rest of the watch's military design elements. With triangular and rectangular markers printed over a primary matte black dial surface, the legibility is phenomenal. But the two most distinguishing features are the use of cathedral style hands at the center and the moisture indicator at the six o'clock position. While the cathedral handset is well established in military watches, the moisture indicator is seldom seen, especially in modern watches. It's designed to change color in the event of water making its way into the case in order to let the diver operator know the watch can't be trusted for timing a dive. In the era in which this tech originates, an accurate working watch was essential life support equipment. And these are indeed functional moisture indicators, which is one of the coolest aspects paying tribute to the original design. From here, this is a back to basics dial design with only the essential elements needed for function. Bulova has clearly intended for the modern and watch to look just like the original, right down to the loom here executed in faux patina that seems to be in great supply, but unfortunately doesn't actually work all that well in practice. But one area where this watch has been upgraded is with the caliber inside. The original ran on a manual caliber. This one comes in with an automatic Salida movement. Now, the majority of Bulova's collection leans into Japanese automatic or quartz movements, which is no surprise as Bulova is owned by the Citizen Watch Group. The brand does though, from time to time, elect to use Swiss made calibers in just more special circumstances. With a recent example of this coming with their tasteful Joseph Bulova collection, a line that was made to embody the path of its origins led by their original founder. Considering the mill ships attach themselves to a similar appeal, the Swiss made variant comes equipped with a Salida SW. 200 that although nothing sexy is an appropriate choice for this instance. If you'd like to learn more about third party movements, I do have a video kind of breaking down the different third party calibers on the entire market. I can link to that below. But in terms of the SW200 general specs, we're looking at a 28,800 vibration per hour beat rate, four Hertz. It does feature hacking and hand winding. So hacking, stopping the second hand when you pull the crown out to the farthest position and has a power reserve of 38 hours. Now, before delivering some closing thoughts on this model, it is important again to note that there is a limited edition model as well as a standard production model. And let's just talk quickly about the differences between both of them. Now, the first thing is going to be the movement and that's gonna also determine price. Looking at $1,990 for the Swiss made version and $895 for the Miyota equipped version. Some other points is the limited edition is 16 millimeters thick and the standard variant is 14 millimeters thick with the limited edition having a much more prominent dome crystal so that thickness is going to come from the crystal doming actually but the limited edition bezel is fully loomed with those markers the hands on the swiss made version are rimmed in white as opposed to the steel on the standard version so some different handset the case back is more prominently engraved on the limited edition version with the standard model leading into a simpler and flatter stamped execution the straps are different with the swiss made having a thinner black nylon strap with a sliding keeper and the standard model has a thicker 
navy blue nylon strap with reinforcements around the holes. Both though, frankly, aren't that great. Also to throw it out there, the limited edition model does come with a large diver helmet display box, but really at the end of the day, the main thing is going to be that movement. The Japanese made eight series caliber. It does feature hacking, and this is the non-date version, the A2S0. And in terms of specs, comes in at 21,600 vibrations per hour, a three hertz movement, features hacking and hand winding, and power reserve of 42 hours. So when trying to unpack these pieces, I had a pretty difficult time because I am conflicted on a few different areas. But just to kind of speak generally about Bulova and their approach as of late, I wanna give them a huge round of applause for what they've been doing with the brand in recent years. This is a watch that about five to 10 years ago, this brand would not have even thought to make and wouldn't even think that they had an audience for it, but they clearly do. And I think in a lot of ways, from a design perspective, they did a fantastic job with it. This is an attractive looking dive watch. But the problem with this watch, and I think probably the same thing that many enthusiasts are going to echo is, especially with the Miyota powered version, there are just certain points and a checklist that enthusiasts have. And when you are catering to enthusiasts, you have to know what those points are. When you're dealing with an eight series movement in a watch that's around $800, $900, that is a tough ask for many enthusiasts. And they know what an eight series movement is because they find it in watches that are significantly cheaper. And with Citizen's access to a variety of Miyota movements, I think if they put a 9,000 series movement in that watch, it'd be a totally different equation. But I think for many enthusiasts, that's going to be a straight non-starter. Also some other design attributes with the 16 millimeter lug width, as well as the bezel and how that is going to be activated. Those are points from a design perspective you have to ask, is it worth going for the one-to-one -one remake or should we make some compromises or maybe not even compromises, but changes to make this perhaps a bit more appealing to a mass market perspective and really give what enthusiasts what they want. And then also things like the added trinkets that come with the overall package. I don't wanna speak for every type of enthusiast out there, but those are things that I don't think many care as much about. You can only bring the watch with you. You can't bring the display box or any other things that are add-ons with the delivered product. So at the end of the day, I would think that most enthusiasts are going to care about the watch only and not these additional add-ons. They would prefer a manufacturer to save the cost there and put more into the watch. Now, those are just some general thoughts as I'm looking at these pieces. And I think it's just great that Bulova is starting to get a little bit more in alignment and kind of getting back to the basics because their archive is way richer than what many people have come to realize. And I think they should just keep going down this path. This watch is well executed from a design perspective. This looks beautiful, as well as with photos and videos. I hope it really does it justice of just how great these watches look. But there are some small things, again, with the design, as well as just the packaging and maybe pricing and positioning of maybe the Miyota mostly that make these a bit challenging for some. These are still really cool watches and I'm a fan of them, but with some small changes, these would have been an absolute slam dunk. But if it's a sign for what is to come from Bulova, and this is what we're going to be seeing in the future, they can take perhaps some feedback on what they're gonna do maybe the next time around. I'm really excited about what this brand has in store because in terms of an archive that has been untapped, I think Bulova is one of the leaders in that category. They have a lot of work they can still do and create some amazing looking watches from a modern context. But all right, guys, I'd love to see your comments down below. What are your thoughts on these new mill ships? Do you agree with some of my points? Do you disagree? Do you like the looks of them? Love to see your comments down below. Also, if you did like the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon. That really does help out the channel. I don't just say that, so really do appreciate that as well. Definitely check out teddybaldestar.com, full authorized dealer of over 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support. All of our products come with a full factory warranty and nine out of every $10 that we generate goes right back in the content we're creating here to help foster up a new generation of watching enthusiasts in the process. If you want to stay up to date with the content, also follow along on Instagram, see some great photos of watches as well there. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.